Good afternoon. Uh, this is Guillermo Sabatier, your host, and welcome to Perspectives on Energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, energy imbalance markets. So this is a EIM for short, and I will be referring to this uh, as EIM is the acronym, but uh, definitely something that's been around for for decades. And of course, myself as the director of, uh, of uh, international services for the Health and Safety Institute. These are some of the things that we go ahead and train on sometimes uh, in our industrial skills, uh, particular set of uh, training classes. So um, there's been a lot of questions regarding uh, what we do with, this, do with these renewable resources, right? That when you have that variability and all those challenges. Well, uh, at least for almost 10 years now, uh, parts of the WEC, which is uh, where California is at and all that other market, they have a pretty robust uh, EIM. And let's break down what that means. So energy imbalance market, basically, it finds a way in a nutshell to accommodate uh, variability in whether you have um, cha changes in output for renewable resources, or if you have a challenge, for example, you have uh, when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, you'll have a, a slight deficit, right? Or when you have, for example, a drop in demand, but you have a lot of wind and a lot of sunshine and nowhere to place that energy in because you don't have enough demand for it, you still have it there. So there's a way for you to be able to sell that power to your neighbors or even uh, different uh, balancing authorities in your in your area to be able to consume that power. So ideally that power is not going to be uh, in essence wasted, right? Um, and really it's 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 by wasting meaning that you probably have to curtail it, uh, curtail production of some of those resources, which um, sadly enough that, that that's really, uh, I, I hate to say free power, but you've already sunk the investment, the initial capitalized cost of building that resource. So at this point, right, whatever output you get out of it is really free power in this case, right? So um, there's still a lot of costs associated with the production of that energy, but at the same time, you know, that's that, that's already a sunk cost. Uh, it's the amount of money you spent building that particular facility. So so anytime you have to curtail production of a solar site or a wind farm, it's, it's really bad for business. So what are the opportunities here, right? So one of the things that has been a concern, right, when dealing with renewable resources often has been uh, this variability. And normally uh, through NERC uh, and all these regions, there is an energy market, right? Where they, uh, it's, it's interchange market where they buy and sell wholesale power. And for the longest time, it was always done on hour by hour increments. Meaning if I'm gonna sell power now for the next hour, and I guess in Hawaii right now, it's going to be, right now it's about one o'clock. We're going into our ending two, right? So we would be going into our ending two. So usually, the hour is planned maybe 75 minutes ahead. Right? So these markets are usually done in, you know, like a intra hour. And uh, a lot of cases they do a day ahead market where they plan all the resources, right? Intra day where it's, it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot more scheduled than planned when the sense that you're already looking at our resources, looking at your load forecast, you have all, all of your, all your, all your generation committed. So at this point, you can decide whether you're going to buy that power or you're going to sell that power and you're going to have a commitment of several hours. The schedule will run for like basically a peak of the day is six hours, seven hours, eight hours, sometimes 16 hours. Elder schedules run 24 hours. So those, those are different ways that it has been traditionally run. And those systems still run to this day. Right? They have those like uh, long types of... Um, schedules already in place and that that market structure has been around for ages right now uh over the years right you you've had to have um adaptability that, that can ramp a lot quicker so there used to be a 15 minute market and that really came about because of the whole fast moving generators and also these, these renewable resources that tend to be a lot more variable right so in a lot of cases you may have an area that's that's not producing enough but they have demand and their neighboring area somewhere is, is, is has an excess. So in that market, there's an opportunity to be able to sell that power from that excess to that demand and capitalize on that particular opportunity. And at the same time, right, it, it, it allows for more uh, reliable operations. And then you're also meeting the demand in this case, based on when you're balancing your resources 
demand balancing, which is why, what they mean by balancing authority. You're balancing generation and load. Generation in this case could be, you know, it's it, it's a uh, it's your it's your source. It's your source, whether it's a conventional generator that spins and cranks out megawatts, or it's uh, wind, which is still a generator you know, powered by wind and moving blades, or it can be a solar site that, of course, depends on the on the uh, the amount of sunshine that's hitting it at what time of the day. And, and then it can even be batteries in this case, right? So a lot of these different resources. So now it, it's it's you're looking at five minute increments in this case, whereas it's gone from an hour to 15 minutes to now the level of granularity, right? On this EIM, it allows them to, to actually make adjustments, you know, for, for the different five minute schedules, which becomes really interesting because, I mean, that tells you the nature of, um, of the variability of these renewable resources, right? Now, how does this impact reliability? Well, so the question here is, is this is happening rather quickly. And a lot of these processes are the bids, the scheduling, the, the actual commitment happens. Happens, you know, it's also offer based and preset. So in a lot of cases, right, they're setting a bid price. You're setting, for example, a, a an ask price. And then that transmission space is really what becomes really important to determine because that power cannot flow from one area to the other uh, without there being the correct transmission space and having all of these like power flows potentially studied ahead of time. So a lot of processing comes into play and uh, software is available now that wasn't perhaps available 10 years ago. So these processes, for example, the, the these long-term planning, next day planning, uh, and almost like real-time operations that looks at contingency analysis by looking at the, your, your state estimator, looking at your network analysis, and then looking at, at, at how these flows impact everything that's happening in your system. And then it's looking at the predictive analysis of where you're going to be an hour from now. So if you're if you're looking at, uh, say, control area A versus control area B, and it has X amount of space on that line, well, it'll determine I can still fit another 10, 15, 20 megawatts, 100 megawatts on that line, and still be okay. And that space allows you the opportunity to be able to ship that power from one area to the other. And I'm sure the same thing apply the other way around. And so a lot of dynamics happening here. And, and again, it's a very dynamic system, but at the same time, right, this really promotes reliability, which had to happen in order for all these renewable resources to be able to a uh, be be consumed right uh, by by the, by the load. Uh, and then this also, for example, making sure that that, that the um, variability wasn't having such a negative impact on reliability. So uh, so here we are finally, right, with the EIM markets very well developed, and, and then now they're spreading out throughout the world. And usually these EIMs are more effective when you have a very robust transmission system with a very robust uh, study of, of that transmission space and that reservation process. So that has to happen very quickly, right? So usually there's no time for actual manual inputs. A lot of this is automated, but there's certain parameters set in place to make those determinations, right? Depending on the economics. But once again, right? As we look at this, the main driver of this market, of course, is the renewable variability. Uh, so what would happen if that variability began to go away, whereas you're storing more of that like excess energy into your storage, your batteries, or what happens, for example, when you are getting some of the renewable resources more, they're they're more efficient at producing power. So one of the questions that arises, right, is that at some point, right, this energy imbalance market may find itself obsolete, depending on how these resources are managed. Um, so, so when you have to like actually be able to pivot every five minutes, that tells you, right, they're either selling, buying or selling ancillary services, which is, for example, uh, re regulation, you're buying and selling, for example, reserves, because all, all of these like electric utilities have to have regulating reserves, have to have contingency reserves, and a lot of those are spinning. And the purpose of that is if you lose generation, right, you need to be able to, to uh, have enough to be able to survive losing your, your most severe single contingency, meaning that, you know, if you need to be able to survive losing your biggest power plant. So a lot of that has to be available uh, at any given time. So having that available means you have it as a resource in your system, you have it available to do it for quick start, 
or you're able to like buy it uh, from one of your neighbors really quickly should the need arise. So these ancillary services are also available you know, over a span of a day. So when you have, for example, a, 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 a balancing authority that's interconnected with all the other balancing authorities in the region, right? Uh, these, you're going to come to a point where the renewable resources are so many, right? Such that everybody is feeding the same amount of variability. And especially if you're if you if you're over a, a region that's large and it's facing the same type of weather conditions and all throughout. So ultimately, right, you're you're looking at potentially, right, a a market either relying on a lot of smaller increments to actually like survive, or you're looking at at no activity because everybody has the same thing going on, and then there there's no profitability in buying and selling power back and forth. So uh, what will be the answer there, when, it, especially from a reliability standpoint, right? So, so one of the things that comes up really is the possibility of storage, right? So, and that by itself be, also becomes another service, ancillary service that could be sold by this market, right? Somebody has excessive, um, excessive outputs, for example, on a renewable resource, or they don't have enough demand, all of a sudden it rains, so it gets cloudy somewhere where their load center is at, but the but the area where they have the uh, the solar sites and the wind is hundreds of miles away. So now you have an excess with nowhere to go. So in this case, right, then if they don't have, if they, they've charged up all the batteries they have and they still have a lot of excess and power, rather than curtailing the output of those resources, they will then go ahead and pay someone else to take the excess and then they'll be able to store that excess energy. And now that storage becomes really important because unlike in the past where energy is either produced and consumed uh, instantaneously, now you have storage where you can go ahead and buy that really that energy really, really cheaply at this point, really cost effectively. Sometimes with negative prices, they'll probably pay you to take your excess energy, right? To take, for example, utility A has a surplus, they will probably have what they call negative prices for those resources, meaning that they're paying their neighbors uh, to go ahead and actually absorb that excess energy. And then that neighbor can capitalize on that and store that excess energy, which is great news really for them because then now they can turn around and get energy that they were paid to store. And then they can turn around and sell that energy somewhere else as when it's needed. And that it can be the same hour, same day, or, you know, or a few days later. Those batteries are usually stored and they keep it charged for a while. So this in itself becomes really interesting when 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 you have the prospect of having um, a lot more energy storage devices set up. The same thing with like for example hydrogen. Even though right now we're, we're we're quite a bit away from quite a bit away away from making that commercially available, the idea of using all these like excess. Uh, this this ex excess uh, output and renewable resources can be used later on to to produce uh, green hydrogen, for example, right? Or that could be used to store. So, um, granted, there's enough capacity to do that, right? the The other challenge here is is at the same time if you have anywhere that there's like uh, well, I don't don't really like to use the word hydro, but if you have pump storage, which is the same principle as hydro, but it's it's recyclable, right? So. Usually a reservoir at a higher elevation, a reservoir at lower elevation. Well, you know, it, it, it can, the water at the lower elevation that's already been used can be pumped back up again and stored. So you can be somewhere in, in the middle where it's halfway full on both sides. You can then e either generate power by, by, by moving water from the high side to the low side, or you can become a load and consume that energy and use that to pump water from the low reservoir to the high reservoir and then of course that's in a way you're building up your battery you're charging a battery but really it's 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 from the physics of hydroelectric power right so that's another example um i don't see if i see a lot of uh, pump storage plants coming into play but there are a few projects in in the blue ridge where they're making some of those like uh they're refurbishing a few of the existing ones and they're probably looking citing a few of them they're going to build soon um, not a lot, of, not a lot of that, of that happening in the in WEC, but uh, definitely opportunities in areas like islands, like Hawaii, for example, and areas like the um, the islands of um, Majorca, Menorca. Uh, I know that there's a project right now in 
in the Canary Islands, for example, where, where they, they collect, for example, a lot of like uh, runoff from, from the mountains, drips down and collects. And then, of course, all that water is used for their water needs as well. So a little bit of ir irrigation, but then a lot of that is also used for, uh, for pump storage, which is really, really beneficial to them, right? So a, a lot of different things. So, so um, with this EIM, the energy imbalance market, of course, uh, it creates a lot of opportunities, but really it was done as a, as a, as a solution to a problem they were having, right? Really, what do you do with all, with all this excess power from the renewable variability? And then, and then who needs, who needs power because their renewables, for example, came short and they're trying to match buyers and sellers, uh, especially sellers that have an excess and buyers that have, that have that are, are surplus where, and they match them with uh, buyers that have, for example, a shortfall. Great solution. It, it just it got uh, really, really, really advanced in the sense that they went from a one hour market to a 15 minute market to now a five minute market, which is definitely interesting. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm excited to see how th this is going to play a role as you see more and more of these, uh, as we approach that renewables need and to discuss, whereas like you're going to get to the point where you're not going to have enough um, inertia in the system, spinning resources to be able to properly handle, for example, a fault on a line or or, or, or deal with a generator loss. So uh, curious to see how that'll happen because um, ultimately these are inverter-based resources, right, that have, do have their limitations. And I think once you get to like 40%, 30 or 40%, uh, I think it's 40% of your resource out there that is is, is these inverter-based resources, uh, things begin to behave a, li a little bit wonky when it comes to responding to certain faults out on the on on that particular part of the broad electric system. So um, really curious to see. But ultimately, uh, I think there's gonna be a, a blend of a portfolio, right? In this regard, where you're gonna have a lot of combined cycle plants that I guess is the cleanest of all of the fossil fuels. And it's the last fuel really that, that's gonna be used as we transition over to this whole uh, uh, um, carbon-free energy future. But uh, I think relying too much on one, one or two types of resources is very dangerous and, 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 and bad for reliability. So I see, again, I see nuclear, uh, and, and I mean small modular reactor nuclear making a bigger impact over the next four or five years. Uh, I see a lot more storage, uh, and that really has to get a lot more cost effective and a lot more responsive. Uh, quite a few companies right now, like EIA Energy Storage Solutions, ESS, has very promising uh, designs, and, and they've already been running commercially for, for, certain, for many years. So for them, it's like the most feasible of all, and uh, they don't have as much... Um, supply issue right, when it comes to uh, materials and uh, supply chain. So uh, SMRs, I think there's at least um, four companies now uh, already get, getting ready to field their, their, their first uh, actually commercially available designs. I know that New Scale is doing feasibility studies for a, for a co-op in uh, Alaska. GE is doing another one. Westinghouse is doing another one. And then there's, there's a South Korean nuclear company that normally built larger facilities are not, it's now getting into the same market as well. So we are uh, definitely looking at changes, but uh, ideally uh, we're catching up with the rest of the world when it comes to nuclear. But uh, as far as technology goes, right, there's at least 12 different types of technologies that involve nuclear that the rest of the world is working with, which, you know, we really haven't done a whole lot in, uh, in the last 20 years. So, uh, uh, plant Vogel, I think, in, uh, in, 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 in the Southeast U.S. has finally come online and it's, 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 uh, it's, it's commercial at this point, but that is the only nuclear plant we have built in, in several decades. So uh, I think those large projects are probably going to be less and less common. And then you'll see a lot more of these smaller SMRs being deployed all throughout the country in this case. Uh, but again, it's good to have a different variety, right, of these resources, and and, and even better when it's like um, e either low carbon emissions or or or, or emissions free in this case. So very enthusiastic, and and this whole um, energy imbalance market, this EIM, played a huge role in making all this possible. Now, how will that work in a place, say, like Hawaii, right? Uh, especially uh, right now, my my heart goes out to the people of Hawaii and uh, especially in Maui where, where they're experiencing these fires, right? So um, very tragic what's going on right now. And uh, the loss of life, the loss of property and, and, and definitely very frightening. So 
uh, are um, my thoughts are with, are with them, and 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 hopefully this um, the island the people make it through rather well quickly, and um, and ho hopefully on a way to quick recovery. So along with that, right, I was noticing that that Hawaiian Electric was having issues with, um, of course, with with the infrastructure, right. A lot of the poles are damaged. A, a lot of the lines are damaged, and now they're they were have to source, for example, new uh, utility infrastructure, whether it's poles. This transformers or substations, right? And then all the conductors and everything else has to be restrung. And a lot of these cases, right, these communities have, have been damaged right, to, to the point that you, you have to rebuild everything from scratch. But uh, what happens when you have, for example, a wildfire that only impacts part of the part of the uh, the island and that area is has a lot of wind, uh, wind generation or a lot of solar generation or a regular conventional plant or or the, those wildfires destroy some of your transmission lines. So in, in this case, right now you're looking at, at having your resource, which is away from your load center, right now, uh, either offline or out of reach. So n being in, in an island, that energy imbalance market, it's a little bit more challenging to be able to implement because of the fact that you know you're in an island. Had the had these islands had, for example, uh, those submarine power uh, power transmission cables connecting all the islands together, then you have a lot more resiliency a lot more reliability. And then of course you are able to uh, survive disturbances are far better. And of course the ultimate the ultimate benefit really to the customers is besides always having your lights on or, or, or having minimizing outages, you also reduce the cost of energy. Um, I know of at least two or three different uh, geothermal sites in, in the islands there that are only operating at 30% capacity because there's not enough load to justify them running at full load, so that's the other challenge. Had had the cables been been laid in commission and constructed, uh, you would see a lot more cost-effective energy being sold to to the uh, consumers in Hawaii, and of course, it would have been emission-free as well. Right? So you would have probably met your carbon goals a lot sooner than 2045. But again, it's it's not uh, launching a undersea cable. So a submarine cable project is not easy, both politically, culturally, and even uh, economically in some cases, right? It, it all depends if somebody comes in with a lot of capital to go ahead and finance those projects. But ultimately, I think it will be a, a really, really a more positive than negative for Hawaii in that, in that case. And then that would, of course, would allow a very robust EIM market to happen in Hawaii uh, because of the fact that they're able to leverage all these different resources on different islands. Uh, and then in, in an example of what you're going through right now, in Maui, for example, you'd be able to go ahead and uh, take advantage of these resources, whether you're able to backfeed an area that's been cut off from, from their source from, you know, uh, from due to these fires, you're able to backfeed it from other places being fed from another island. So that would be a huge advantage in this case, but that's a discussion for another day. So anyway, I, I think that is all I have for today. Uh, thank you all for listening. And once again, uh, my my thoughts and best wishes are, are for all the victims of, the, of these fires. And definitely hope you all do well and uh, understand it's serious. So thank you again. And uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and leave comments below. I'll try and get to them as soon as I can. And also for additional instruction, go to hsi.com, industrial skills. So hsi.com slash industrial skills. This should be in the uh, in the uh, show information as far as how we can help you further with understanding EIM, energy imbalance markets, and how, for example, these like um, you, you you leverage this to be able to manage the system more reliably. Again, thank you and have a wonderful day and best of luck for everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.